Welcome to J4's English Training. I'm Jennifer, and today you're going to learn English through stories. We're going to review four different news articles, and through this review, you're going to learn a lot of advanced vocabulary, advanced grammar, and even correct pronunciation. Let's get started. The title is Anna May Wong, who is this woman. Does she look familiar to you? Doesn't look familiar to me. Anna May Wong, actress, becomes first Asian American on U.S. currency. Now, currency. This is another word for money. So, currency is just describing the money in the U.S. Currency is in dollars or coins, in paper bills or coins. So, currency is another word for money. Actress Anna Mae Wong is set to become the first Asian American to be featured on U.S. currency. Basically, what the title said. Now, here, this is a great expression to be set to become. So, what do you notice here? What is this to become? This is an infinitive, an infinitive. And what kind of verb is this? Well, of course, the verb to be, right? Now, this is important because it helps you understand the sentence structure for expressions because this expression is formed with the verb be and then set, be set, and then we have our infinitive. Now, in this case, the infinitive is to become, but we could change the infinitive verb to something else. And then notice, we have our verb conjugated with our subject. Who is the subject? Anna Mae Wong, of course. So our subject is she, and that's why it is is. She is set to become. Now, what does this mean? Be set to and infinitive. So this simply means be ready to or be prepared to. So you can use it in the same way. You might say, for example, I'm set to present at tomorrow's meeting. So my verb to be is conjugated with the subject I. We have our verb set, which doesn't change. And then we have our infinitive. In this case, my verb is present. And the infinitive doesn't change also. So the only thing you're conjugating is the verb to be. I'm set to present at tomorrow's meeting. Now, native speakers will frequently add the word all for no reason at all. It doesn't add anything to the meaning of it. I'm all set. I'm all set to go to the mall. I'm ready to go to the mall. You don't have to do that. It's just optional. So you could say, I'm set. I'm set to go to the airport, for example. I'm ready to go. I'm prepared to go. She will appear as part of an effort to feature notable women on American quarters. Wong, who is considered the first Chinese American film star in Hollywood, is the fifth and final woman to be individually featured on the coin this year. Okay, on the coin. What coin are we talking about? Hmm, a little listening comprehension quiz for you. On the coin, the coin, which coin? Well, the coin is here. The quarter, the quarter. This could be tricky for you if you're not familiar with American currency, which again means money. So quarter is a type of coin, which is why we have it here. And the value is 25 cents or 0.25 0.25 of a dollar. That's the value of a quarter. So it doesn't get you very much.
Now, I want to talk about pronunciation because I hear a lot of mistakes with the pronunciation of women, women. This is, well, I'll ask you, is this singular or plural? Singular or plural? Women, women, notable women. This is plural. So one woman, two women. I want you to notice my pronunciation. One woman, wo, uh, woman, woman, two we, eh, eh, women, two women, one woman, two women. Good pronunciation tip for you to practice. All right, now. Keep in mind this quarter because I know there's a picture of the quarter below, so you'll get to see this. And remember, a quarter is a coin and its currency, and it's worth 25 cents or 0.25 of a dollar. The quarter will enter general circulation on Monday. To enter general circulation, this is a very formal way of saying will be used by people. So you will get it when you go to a store, when you go to the bank, you will receive it. I don't think you really need to know that for your vocabulary. It's quite formal, but for listening comprehension, for reading comprehension, now you know what it means. It, what does the it represent? It, the quarter, the quarter, that's the it. It, the quarter, will feature President George Washington on one side and Wong on the other. So we have this coin, there's two sides of the coin. One side is the president, the other side, Wong. Ventress Gibson, director of the U.S. Mint, called Wong a courageous advocate who championed for increased representation and more multidimensional roles for Asian American actors. Now here, this is a good word to have in your vocabulary. It's quite formal, but we use this often in a business context and you will see it a lot when you're reading anything from the news. So you hear, in this case, they're using it as a noun. She was an advocate. Notice I have a courageous advocate because right now advocate is separated by my adjective courageous. So because of that, this is our adjective, because of that, I need my article a ah, because a ah goes with courageous. But if I just have advocate and no adjective in front of it, then I need an, an advocate. Because we use an when you have a vowel sound, a vowel sound before, an advocate. So you can say, she was an advocate. This is the noun. We very commonly use this as a verb form. She advocated for Asian American actors. She advocated for. When you advocate for, notice our preposition choice here. You don't advocate to, advocate on, advocate in, you advocate for. When you're learning vocabulary, it's very helpful to learn the prepositions when you learn the words, because if you don't use the correct preposition, it will be grammatically incorrect and it won't sound very good either. She advocated for. Um, Asian American actors. So you can advocate for someone. This would be a someone, a group of people. You can also advocate for something. So you might say she advocated for increased representation. So this is a something. Our preposition doesn't change. We still need for in both cases, something something, increased representation, or someone, Asian American actors. And when you advocate for someone or something, 
You act as a representative for them, a supporter for them. You want to promote their views and you want to promote their cause, whatever that cause may be. So you're supporting them. It's just a more formal way of saying it, but very common in a newspaper context. You'll hear it a lot in the media and it is a good business verb to have as well. This quarter, oh, we're going to see the quarter. Are you excited? Dun, dun, dun. Here's the quarter. So remember, this is worth 25 cents or one quarter of a dollar, 0.25 of a dollar, one quarter. That's why it's called quarter. So this is a coin, remember? coin, a coin. The name of the coin is a quarter. There are different coins in American currency. And remember, currency is money. So this is a type of currency and the type of coin it is, is a quarter. This is a very nice quarter, isn't it? So if you're in the U.S. right now, you can go to a store, go to a bank, and you might receive this coin. You might receive this quarter. That would be pretty cool. And remember, on the other side, we have President, who was it? George Washington, I believe. This quarter is designed to reflect the breadth and depth of of accomplishments by Anna Mae Wong, who overcame challenges and obstacles she faced during her lifetime, she said. Let's look at breadth and depth. Now, breadth is the range. So if someone has a breadth of knowledge, it means their knowledge is wide on many different subjects. And depth you can think of as this way. So you have all these different subjects. Let's say one subject is politics, and then you have your depth of politics. So you know many different subjects, that's your breadth of knowledge, and then within each subject, you know a lot about that subject, and that's your depth. So that's a great expression we have. We usually use breadth and depth in terms of knowledge. Here you can see they're doing it with accomplishments. So she could have a breadth of accomplishments, maybe accomplishments as an actress, accomplishments as a teacher, accomplishments as an advocate. And then within each accomplishment, she has a depth of accomplishment. So she has many different times that she advocated or many different times that she was a successful actress. Let's, oh, here's our lovely quarter again. I'd really like to see one in person now. Let's move on. Wong was born in Los Angeles in 1905. 1905. Notice how I'm pronouncing this as O. The number is zero. Zero, one, two, three. I have zero dollars in my bank account. Hopefully you don't need to say that. I have zero dollars in my bank account. <laughs> Hopefully not you. Now, of course, that is this zero, zero, one, two, three. But I wouldn't say 1905. I would for dates. Let me continue here with our date. So with date, you pronounce it as O. That's the pronunciation. 1905. 1905. That's the pronunciation here. But if I'm telling someone my phone number, I might say, I could say 0019 if this was part of my phone number or 0019. So you could do either with a phone number, zero or O. Both of them are quite common to be honest. So with phone numbers, 
addresses even. I live at 0019 or 0019 addresses. Um, money, you would say zero. So for money, you would definitely say z zero. But for dates, we would say, oh, 1905. Wang was born in Los Angeles in 1905 to Chinese immigrants. Her name at birth was Wang Liu Sung. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But later in life, she adopted the stage name of Anna Mae Wang. And I'm sure this is exactly why she changed her name because Americans don't know how to pronounce that, unfortunately formed by joining her English and family names. She was cast in her first role at 14 as an extra in the film The Red Lantern and continued to take on smaller parts until her lead role in The Toll of the Sea in 1922. You probably don't know these movies. Maybe you do. I don't know these movies. Let's look at this here. What did I want to show you? Okay, first of all, when you're cast in a movie role, this is a verb specific for the entertainment industry. So you can be cast in a TV show, a play, a movie, anything that you perform in. And that is used for the entertainment industry. It means that she was hired for the job, but they don't use this vocabulary in the entertainment industry. This is why when you're learning a language is so important to understand the specific industry you're in and then learn the terms and the vocabulary of that industry. If you're in the medical industry, or if you're a lawyer or an engineer, you're going to have very specific vocabulary to your industry and you need to learn that vocabulary. So if you're in the entertainment industry, you should probably already know this verb to be cast in a role. So anyone else would just say she was hired for the job. This is in a a regular context, not the entertainment industry. Okay, here we have a great phrasal verb to take on, to take on. When you take something on, you accept responsibility for a project or a task. In this case, she accepted responsibility for a part, which is a part of a movie. So she was in the movie for a portion of time. Your boss, for example, might say, can you take on this client? Which means, can you accept responsibility for this client, for this job? Or I took on too many projects last month. So last month you said, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. You accepted responsibility for different tasks or different assignments, but it was too much. Or you might say, sorry, I can't take that on right now. I already have a lot on my plate. I'm teaching you a bonus expression right here. The expression is to have a lot on 
and then one's plate. The one in this case is me, so I'm changing it to my. But I might say, you have a lot on your plate. She has a lot on her plate. He has a lot on his plate. They have a lot on their plate. Now that means to be very busy. To have a lot on one's plate is an idiom and it means to be very busy. So that could be the reason why you can't take that on, that being whatever project it is. I can't take on that project. I can't take that on. I have a lot on my plate. So that's a great idiom for you to start using. She appeared in more than 60 movies across her career. That's a lot of movies. That's impressive. Including silent films and one of her first, one of the first made in Technicolor. Interesting. Wong was also the first Asian American lead actor in a U.S. television show, The Gallery of Madame Louis Song, in which she played a Chinese detective. After facing discrimination in the U.S., she traveled to Europe to work in English, French, and German films. I link this expression here. After, and then you have a gerund. This is a great sentence structure for you to use to sound quite advanced. So you can say, after graduating, I moved abroad. After improving my English, I took on more public speaking. So you accepted responsibility for, I took on more public speaking after improving. Now you could absolutely say after I improved and then everything else would be the same. But notice in this case, we're using a gerund verb. And in this case, I'm using subject, and then my verb is going to be conjugated in the past simple because the action is complete. After I graduated, I moved abroad. After graduating, I moved abroad. To me, this sounds very natural. It has a nice flow to it, and it sounds more advanced than saying after I graduated. So I highly recommend you add this to your vocabulary. Remember, it is after plus gerund. After plus gerund, which is your verb in ing. How much do we have? Okay, we're almost done here. She was awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960 and died the following year, aged 56. Gemma Chan, known for appearing in Crazy Rich Asians and Marvel's Eternals, is set to portray Wong in an upcoming biopic about the star's life. Oh, so we're going to have a movie coming out about Wong in the near future. Now, here's our expression again, is set to. What does this mean? Is prepared to or ready to. And remember, it's to be set and then infinitive. So here our infinitive is to portray. And our verb to be is conjugated with he, she, it. Because what's the subject in this case? Our subject is Gemma Chan. Our subject is quite far removed from our verb, which happens a lot in spoken English, of course, but it happens equally in written English. All of this in the commas is just extra additional information, but our subject is Gemma Chan and our verb is conjugated with the subject. She's ready to portray Wong. The American women 
the American Women Quarters Program. So this is one name of something, the American Women Quarters Program. Remember our pronunciation of women, wi, wi, women, women. The American Women Quarters Program began this year and will feature five women each year until 2025. Native Hawaiian hula teacher Edith Kana, Kanaka Ole Kanaka Ole has been named as one of the selections for 2023. So they're talking about a different quarter. So remember our quarter quarter. So in 2023 is going to be the Hawaiian hula teacher who's going to be on the quarter. So you can look out for that as well. Has been named as one of the selections for 2023. So that's the end of the article. There was one other thing I wanted to explain before we wrap up, which means to end before we wrap up, before we end the following year, aged 56. I see a lot of mistakes with age. So you can say she was 56 when she died. So this is correct. You can also say she was 56 years old when she died. That is correct. How about this one? She was 56 years when she died. What do you think? She was 56 years when she died. Is this correct or incorrect? What do you think? This is incorrect. You can't say that. I see this a lot. So you have two options when saying age. You can say just the number. 56. She was 56. Or you can include years old. 56 years old. Those are your two options. This is not correct. You cannot just say years. You either have to get rid of it or you have to add old. But this by itself is not correct. So make sure you don't say that one. And that is the end of the article. So I hope you enjoyed learning about our actress who is on the quarter, Anna Mae Wong. And remember, you can watch that upcoming movie about her that's going to be played by Gemma Chan. So that will be quite interesting. So I hope you enjoyed the article. Amazing job with this lesson. Now, I want you to take one of your new expressions that you learned from this article and leave some example sentences in the comments below so you can practice your new vocabulary. Trump team finds two documents with classified markings in a Florida storage unit. Just to make sure everyone knows what this is, because we'll be talking about it a lot. Classified, this is information considered secret. So secret information. Now, this is most commonly used with the government, but you can use it with anyone, really. Let's say you call a doctor's office and try to ask information about someone else. They'll tell you, oh, sorry, that's classified information. They can't give you personal information about someone else. It's considered secret. So we can use this in other places aside from government. Two documents with classified markings were found in a Florida storage unit during a search by a team hired by former President Donald Trump's lawyers, a person familiar with the situation told CNN. Okay, so again, classified, this is being used as an adjective, is describing what type of markings. Markings are just 
anything on it. So it could be a scribble, it could be an X, it could be a check mark, it could be something circled. All of those were markings. But if it's classified, you can't see this. So sorry, that's classified. You can't see it. It's secret. A storage unit is a, a small unit that people use to keep information or anything, not just information, that they can keep objects. So let's say you live in a small apartment or even a giant house. You might want to get a storage unit to keep old furniture that you no longer want in your house or any objects. You can put that in a storage unit. What else here? Okay. A person familiar with the situation told CNN. Now they're giving you these details because the source of the information is classified. They don't want to reveal the actual person, probably because that person might get in trouble if they identify their name. So you see this a lot in the media where they don't tell you someone's name specifically. Now notice here we have CNN. I'm sure you know what this is. It's one of the biggest media networks in North America at least. But I want you to notice that there is no article. Okay, but you're probably familiar with the BBC. The B, sorry, BC. Now in this case, the article is part of the name. So sometimes we have proper names and the general rule is that proper names don't have articles. Okay. But sometimes for companies, the article is part of the name. So the name of the company isn't just BBC. It's the BBC, but we're not using an article with CNN because CNN is a proper noun, which just means it's a name. It's the company name, but the name does not include an article. So you could say, I saw that, or maybe I read that I read that on CNN. You don't have to say the CNN because that isn't part of their name. Just like you would say, I watched that on Netflix, right? That's the name. It's not the Netflix. I watched that on the Netflix. No, because that's not the name. It's just Netflix. I watch that on Netflix, but notice with BBC, you would say, I read that on the BBC because the article the is part of the name. So I'm sharing that just because I know a lot of students are very familiar with the BBC. So I don't want you to be confused about why there isn't a article here with CNN. Let's continue on. Those documents were handed over to the FBI. Okay, to hand something over, this is when you officially give something to someone, but usually because it was requested. So hand over, I'm just giving it to you. But we use this a lot in a legal concept. In this case, a government concept because they have legal authority, right? But in a legal setting, you might be required to hand over documents to the lawyer by someone. Maybe the judge is requiring you to hand over the documents. So it simply means give the documents. But when we use hand over, it sounds more like a an official or formal request. 
So that's what I would say. And this is a phrasal verb because we have the verb and the preposition. To hand something over, this is to an official request to give something <laughs> to someone. Okay, so for example, you might say, we're required to hand over these receipts to the auditor. So an auditor is someone who investigates your tax information, your reporting information, your financial information for a person or for a company. So you might have specific business receipts that you claimed were an expense and you were required to hand them over. Okay, let's continue on. No other documents with classified markings were found during a search of four of Trump's properties, the source said. The source, again, this is commonly used to say that a person provided this information, but often people don't want to be known. You don't want to identify that John Smith share this information because John Smith might be a friend of Trump or an employee of Trump, and he could get in trouble for sharing that information. So the source represents a person who does not want to be identified. You see this a lot in the media. So let's say somebody shared information with you and they gave you some advice and said, you don't have to file your taxes this year, okay? You might say, who's the source of that information? So you want to know where the information originated. Who's the source? Who's the source? You can just say that or you can say, who's the source of this information, and then you can identify the information. So the source is the person, the source, person. Well, it doesn't have to be a person. It could come from a website, for example. So where the information originated, where it came from. Let's continue on. The discovery of the documents was first reported by the Washington Post. Now, I want to point this out as a grammar issue because here we have the documents. That's plural, right? So think of your subject. I, you, he, she, it, we, they. You always want to come back to those core subjects to identify the conjugation of your verb. Because what verb is this? Was. What verb is this? Well, of course, it's the verb to be in the past simple, right? So this is to be past simple. Now, there are two options for the verb to be in the past simple. You have was or were. Now, we use was, I, he, she, it, was, but you were, we were, they were. Now we have the documents. So that would be what subject? I, you, he, she, it, we, they. The documents is they. So if the subject, the documents, this represents they, then why do we have was and not were? Because we need were, right? It's because the documents is not the subject that's being conjugated. This is even a mistake that some native speakers make. They take the noun directly beside the verb and assume that's the subject. It's not. It's this, the discovery. The discovery 
is our subject of the sentence. And this is an it. It was. The discovery was first reported by the Washington Post. So that's our subject and that's why it's conjugated with was. This information of the documents, that's just additional information to tell you more about the discovery. But our subject is the discovery. So this is our subject and it's it. It was. Don't let that confuse you when you're deciding what your subject is, deciding what your verb conjugation is. Always think about the subject. Now notice here, the Washington Post, and notice the is in uppercase. It's in uppercase capital because we capitalize proper names. Now the is part of the name, and that's why it's capitalized. But remember, CNN, the source, the source of this article doesn't use the article, the CNN, is just CNN. Let's continue on. The team of two searched Trump Tower in New York, the Bedminster Golf Club, an office location in Florida, and the storage unit where the two documents were found and where the General Services Administration had shipped Trump's belongings after he left the White House. Okay, so all of this additional information tells you more about the storage unit. It relates directly to the storage unit. The storage unit is where the two documents were found. Remember the two documents with that classified secret information. And it's also where the General Services Administration which I assume is a government department, had shipped Trump's belongings. Now, belongings are anything that belong <laughs> to you. That is where the word belongings come from. Okay, so to belong is a verb. This is a good grammar point and a vocabulary point. So to belong this is a verb. Now, belongings, this is a noun. And we generally use it with one's belongings. So it's my belongings, your belongings, his belongings, Trump's belongings. So we could say Trump's belongings were shipped to his storage locker or a unit to to say that sentence in a different way but to maintain the meaning now a belonging could be anything anything that belongs to you it could be as simple as a pen it's your cell phone it's your <laughs> clock it's everything that belongs to me everything in this room right here is my belonging including this microphone my rings my headband everything right so those are your belongings now let's take a step back and let's take a look at our grammar as well. We have had shipped, had shipped. This is the past perfect. The past perfect, it confuses students, but it's a really useful verb tense because it tells you when things happened. And that's its only purpose. We have two actions that happened. So the two docs documents, that's how I would shorten docs documents. Two documents were found. Okay. So found and then documents shipped. These are our two actions. But interestingly, this action 
comes first in our story. So I might think if I'm just reading this, I might think that this action happened first because it was told first in the article. But grammatically, I know that this action happened first because of the grammar had shipped. Okay. So the past perfect is the older action. So past perfect action that, so a past action because it's past perfect, past action that happens before another past action. Okay. Now, action, the first action is the past perfect. And the second action, which is the newer action, is the past simple. Past simple. The documents were found. The documents had shipped. So do a little practice with the past perfect. It's a very useful verb tense and it doesn't need to be confusing. <laughs> Let's continue on. The four searches came amid lingering concerns from the Justice Department that not all documents had been returned to the federal government. Carried out in recent weeks, the searches were overseen by Trump's legal team, another source familiar with the matter told CNN. Okay, let's take a look at this. Very useful. This is a preposition and it means in the middle of in the middle of. So the four searches came in the middle of these concerns. So you have these concerns and in the middle of them, amid the concerns, they started searching. They completed the searches. So I'll give you another example in a political context. You might say, this scandal happened amid the election. Now, the election takes place over a period of time. You have a beginning and an end of the election. So the election is going, 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 and then a scandal happens. Now, the scandal happens amid the election. So in the middle of, it doesn't necessarily have to be the very middle. It could be closer to the beginning or closer to the end. It's just another way of saying during. Now let's move on to the word right beside it, because you're probably wondering about this and that's lingering. So lingering is a verb. And in this case, it's being used as an adjective because it's giving more information about the concerns. What type of concerns? They're lingering concerns. To understand the adjective, you just need to know the meaning of the verb. So the verb is to linger, to linger. This is when something remains longer than wanted or expected, wanted, needed, or expected. We use this verb a lot, so add it to your vocabulary. Let's say you have a cold, okay? So maybe you have a sore throat, and a little bit of a stuffed up nose, a cough, and you expect that to last for three to five days, okay? That's how long you expect it to last. But 10 days later, two weeks later, you're still coughing. <laughs> then you can say, my cold... My cold is lingering. 
is lingering. It's in the present continuous because it's taking place right now. It's lingering. Once it's done, you can say my cold lingered for two weeks. My cold lingered for two weeks. We also use this with the weather a lot because you expect summer to be warm for a certain amount of time or winter to be cold for a certain amount of time or for rain to happen for a certain amount of time. And if it takes longer than expected, you can say, oh, wow, the cold, this, in this case, the weather, the snow is lingering. The rain is lingering. Now we use this in more of a negative way. So I generally wouldn't say the sunshine is lingering because I want the sunshine to stay. But if you don't want the sunshine, then you can use lingering. So in this case, it's an adjective. It's saying the concerns stayed longer than expected. So the concerns from the Justice Department that not all documents had been returned, that stayed longer than they were expecting. So these are two great adjectives. A great vocabulary. One's a preposition, one's an adjective, and now you have the verb as well. Add it to your vocabulary. Let's continue on. Trump's attorney offered to let federal investigators observe the search at his Bedminster property, but that offer was declined. Given the Justice Department's response, Trump lawyers did not make a similar offer for the search of the other properties. Okay, given the Justice Department's response, this is a preposition and is very useful. Notice how here it starts the sentence and the meaning is considering, considering something. So the something is the Justice Department's response. So remember, they declined the past search. So when we consider how they responded in the past, we're not going to ask them again because they said no in the past. So why would they say no? Yes, now, if they said no before. So given that response, considering it. Now, this is very useful expression. We use it a lot. You might say, uh, given his age, I'm surprised he's running again. Okay. Given his age, Trump is quite old, right? So I'm surprised he's running, in this case, running for office. This is when you want to be elected. You run for a position where you're elected. It's just the vocabulary we would use. It's not running, although it actually makes sense because somebody who's quite old, you also wouldn't expect them to start running. So you might say, given his age, I'm surprised he ran the marathon. So you use this in the sense, when I consider his age, knowing how old he is, I'm surprised. So very useful preposition to have in your speech. Let's continue on. It would be highly unusual for the Justice Department to observe searches that aren't conducted by law enforcement. The department declined to comment. Stephen Chang, a spokesperson, spokesman for Trump, <laughs> Generally, we try to avoid gen or gendered words now. Notice how I said spokesperson because it's a little outdated to use spokesman because in the past they would use this for men and women, fireman, firewoman, 
uh, male man, male women. But now we don't really say that. We just use person to try to be more gender neutral, more inclusive. So you can say that, but the more modern way to say it is spokesperson. <laughs> spokesperson for Trump said so the former president and his counsel continue to be cooperative and transparent. Okay, transparent. This is when you freely share information with others. So this is an adjective that is used a lot, especially in positions of authority or power within your company. You might complain that uh, your boss isn't very transparent, which means they don't share a lot of information with you. So to freely share information. And you can use this in a positive. My boss is very transparent. Which is generally a positive because they share information freely. Or you can use it in a negative. My boss isn't very transparent, which is more of a negative. They're not sharing information with you, which can be can make it difficult for you to do your job or make decisions. So that's a good adjective there. It is unclear what the subsequent contact between the Trump legal team and federal investigators has been since the searches. So subsequent, this means happening after. Okay, so they had searches in the past. So search one happened three months ago. Search two happened two weeks ago. So you could say they had search one and then subsequently they had search two. So subsequent is when something happens after something. So subsequent happens after. Now we use this as an adverb quite a lot. You could say I got a promotion and subsequently bought my dream house. So you did this action after this action. And when you use subsequently, it implies the relationship between the two. You were able to do this because of this one. So it also shows a relationship. So notice this is being used as an adverb, an adverb. Let's complete the article. CNN previously reported exclusively that Trump's legal team was considering allowing federal agents to search Mar-a-Lago again to satisfy justice demands that all sensitive government documents were returned. The matter was addressed in a court proceeding this fall where the Justice Department asked a judge to issue an order compelling the Trump team to arrange for another search. Let's look at this here. Order compelling the Trump team. This is another way of saying forcing, forcing. So they're trying to force the team to arrange another search. They're saying you must arrange another search. So this is a verb to compel, to compel. And this is to force someone to do something. So this probably happens a lot in the workplace. You might say, my company is compelled us to work in the office. So a lot of people are transitioning from working from home to working in the office. But when you use the verb compel, it sounds like they're not asking. They're not saying, hey, do you want to work in the office? Do you want to stay at home? They're compelling. They're forcing. You must work in the office. So this is a very useful verb. 
All right. So that's our article. Now let me go back and I'll read it from start to finish so you can pay attention to my pronunciation. Trump team finds two documents with classified markings in a Florida storage unit. Two documents with classified markings were found in a Florida storage unit during a search by a team hired by former President Donald Trump's lawyers, a person familiar with the situation told CNN. Those documents were handed over to the FBI. No other documents with classified markings were found during a search of four of Trump's properties, the source said. The discovery of the documents was first reported by the Washington Post. The team of two searched Trump Tower in New York, the Bedminster Golf Club, an office location in Florida, and the storage unit where the two documents were found and where the General Services Administration had shipped Trump's belongings after he left the White House. The four searches came amid lingering concerns from the Justice Department that not all documents had been returned to the federal government. Carried out in recent weeks, the searches were overseen by Trump's legal team, another source familiar with the matter told CNN. Trump's attorneys offered to let federal investigators observe the search at his Bedminster property, but that offer was declined. Given the Justice Department's response, Trump lawyers did not make a similar offer for the search of the other properties. It would be highly unusual for the Justice Department to observe searches that aren't conducted by law enforcement. The department declined to comment. Stephen Chang, a spokesman for Trump, said the former president and his counsel continued to be cooperative and transparent. It is unclear what the subsequent contract between the Trump legal team and federal investigators has been since the searches. CNN previously reported exclusively that Trump's legal team was considering allowing federal agents to search Mar-a-Lago again to satisfy justice demands that all sensitive government documents were returned. The matter was addressed in a court proceeding this fall where the Justice Department asked a judge to issue an order compelling the Trump team to arrange for another search. Amazing job with that article. Now feel free to hit pause, take a break, go get a cup of coffee or tea, review the vocabulary you just learned, and when you're ready, hit play and we'll continue on with the next article. Will Smith says bottled rage led him to slap Chris Rock at the Oscars. So this is very important to understand our article. So slap, this is slap. It's a verb to slap. It's very commonly associated with violence. So in a negative way, however, you could slap a mosquito or a fly on your arm, for example. So you can use it in other contexts, but more commonly used in violence, fighting between two people. Okay, let me explain this because I believe this is mentioned again, bottled rage, bottled rage. So rage, of course, is an emotion. It means to be very, 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 very angry, okay? That's rage. Now, what does bottled rage mean? Bottled... Imagine here we have a bottle, right? And the water is in the bottle and it can't get out, right? So if you have a bottled emotion, rage, anger, jealousy, hatred, generally a negative emotion, it means that emotion is inside of you and can't get out, just like the water can't get out of this bottle. So it's when you have an emotion and you do not express it, you keep it inside of you. So if you keep anger, rage, jealousy, hatred inside of you, eventually it can come out and you might do something violent like slap someone. Let's continue on. 
Will Smith has said his bottled rage led him to slap comedian Chris Rock. Here's our comedian Chris Rock on stage at the Oscars in March. The actor has been interviewed for the first time since the incident, which he described as a horrific night. Horrific, this is a great adjective. A lot of times students will use very common adjectives, good, bad, because it's the ones they know. But adding more advanced adjectives will make your English sound more advanced and will give you more color to your language as well. A horrific night. So this is a very, very, very bad <laughs> night. That's how you can think of it. A very, very bad night. So if somebody asks you, how was your day? You could say, I had a horrific day, which means very, very bad. Or you can describe an event that was horrific. That was very, very bad. When I saw Will Smith slap Chris Rock, that was horrific. So you can say, I had, I had a horrific day. All right, let's move on. Appearing on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, he said, I was going through something that night, you know. Now, our he is Will Smith. So just remember that through the story, he, unless said otherwise, is Will Smith. I was going through. So I, Will Smith, I was going through something that night, you know. So he's describing what happened that night when he slapped the comedian Chris Rock, that horrific night. I was going through something. To go through something. This is an expression and we use this say to experience something difficult in our lives. And we use this more as a general expression when we don't really want to specify what it is. So if somebody asks you, what's wrong? You seem upset. You can just say, I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going through a lot right now. And that's just general, but it lets the person know you're experiencing something difficult. Now they might follow up and say, well, what? Tell me more. And then you can say, I lost my job. I, my car was in an accident. My mom got sick. So you can list the difficult things in your life. So we use this as a general statement. What's wrong? I'm going through a lot right now. I'm going through a lot right now. Now notice it's our verb to be. So, or sorry, not our verb to be. Our verb is go. So that's the verb you're going to conjugate. Now here it's in the past continuous. That's why we have I was going. I was going. And here it's in the present continuous. I'm going. Because you're experiencing the difficulty right now. Not that that justifies my behavior at all. So Will Smith is saying the fact he was experiencing something difficult, that's not an excuse. If something justifies something, it's an excuse. It says it's okay that I slapped him because I was going through something. But he's saying that doesn't justify it. That's not an excuse. So you can think of this as an excuse. But remember, they're using it in the negative, an excuse. Not that that justifies my behavior. It's not an excuse. Smith added that there were many nuances and complexities to it, but added, I just, I lost it. I lost it. Now notice here, I lost it. What do you think that? It is. I lost it. What? What did he lose? His keys? His wallet? No. 
When we use this in a general sense, I lost it. And I know what the context of the story is. He slapped someone. I know that it means his sense of control over himself, his emotions, his actions. I lost it. So we use this in the sense, I lost it yesterday in the meeting. So maybe you were in this meeting and your coworker said she couldn't finish the project and you lost it. What do you mean you couldn't finish the project? That's unacceptable. And you get really, really angry. You lose control of your emotions, your actions. You get taken over by the emotion, maybe the bottled, the bottled emotion, your bottled anger, your bottled rage. So I lost it. This is an expression. Hopefully you don't have to use it too often because it's not a positive expression. So to lose it, this means to lose control over your emotions, your your actions as well, because you might just start yelling at your coworker, but you didn't really want to, you feel really bad after, but in that moment, you just couldn't control it. You lost control. Smith stormed the stage at the Hollywood award ceremony after Rock made a joke about Smith's wife, Jada's shaved head. Woo, that's kind of a tongue twister. She has the hair loss condition, alopecia. Now, notice how in the article they explain what alopecia is because it's not a very common condition. They explain it's a hair loss condition and it's a hair loss condition for women because men, unfortunately, lose their hair and we call that bald, to be bald, to be bald, to be bald. This uh, describes a man with no head hair, no head hair, right? To be bald. But we don't usually associate that with women. So there's a condition when women lose their hair is called alopecia. Now, I want to point out these apostrophe S's. In, the, in this case, the apostrophe S is used to show possession, possession. So Smith's wife, the wife belongs to Smith, to Will Smith. And then they're saying her name, Jada. That's his wife's name, Jada. Now, but the shaved head belongs to Jada. So that's why there is an apostrophe S. The shaved head belongs to Jada. And shaved head is when you would go like this and then you get rid of all your hair. That would be a shaved head. I believe it looks like his head is shaved here. So he would go like this and then the hair is very close to his his scalp. That's a shaved head. Now, very common for men, but not that common for women. And the comedian, Chris Rock, he made a joke about Will Smith's wife's shaved head. So shaved head. We talked about what this is. Shaved head. Hurt people hurt people. I understand how shocking that was for people. He told Noah. Noah is the TV show host. Remember, he went Will Smith went on The Daily Show with the host, Trevor Noah. So Will Smith is saying this to the TV show host, Noah. I understand how shocking that was for people. So shocking. This is a great adjective. Just look at my face right now. <gasps> that is shocking. <gasps> what? <gasps> so when you receive news and it causes you to go, <gasps> what? You lost your job? What? <gasps> but shocking is generally used in a negative context because we might go <gasps> in more of a positive. 
you just got engaged? That's amazing. <gasps> but that's more surprise, which is can be a more positive emotion, but generally shocking. When we describe something as shocking, there's a negative emotion in there. So when Will Smith slapped <laughs> the comedian, <gasps> imagine what the audience did. They would have gone, <gasps> shocking how shocking that was. I was gone. That was a rage that had been bottled for a really long time. So again, that emotion, it's inside and you're not letting it out. You're not expressing your emotion. So because we've seen this for a few times, we do have some common expressions. Generally, we say, you shouldn't bottle your emotions. Sometimes we add the optional preposition up to create a phrasal verb, to bottle up. You shouldn't bottle up your emotions, which means you shouldn't keep your emotions inside of you, you should express them. So to express your emotion is when you might say to someone, hey, you hurt my feelings today, or I felt really sad today, instead of just keeping it inside of you and not expressing it, bottling it up inside of you. He said he also understood the pain he had caused and recalled the reaction of his nine-year-old nephew that night. So Will Smith's nine-year-old nephew watched the award ceremony and saw his uncle slap someone. And the reaction is when you go, oh, and that's the shock. That could be the reaction. Now, nephew, this describes a boy. It's used for males and it's your sibling's child. So your sibling's child. Your sibling's male child. It has to be for a male. Now notice I have my apostrophe S because the child belongs to your sibling and sibling is your brother or sister. Sibling is gender neutral. It can be for brother or sister. It does not matter. Sibling. But nephew is only used for the male child of your sibling. Now we have a separate word for the female child. Do you know what that is? Your sibling's female child. This is niece, niece, niece. Your sibling's female child, niece. So you might have a niece and a nephew or just a nephew or just a niece. He's the sweetest little boy, Smith said. We came home and he had stayed up late to see his uncle Will and we're sitting in my kitchen and he's on my lap and he's holding the Oscar and he's just like, why did you hit that man, Uncle Will? Oh, that's really sad. Why did you hit that man? Now, hit can be a slap. It's the same thing. So when I slap you, <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> when I slap someone, I also hit them. It's the same thing. But hit is more general. So this is also hit. But this is is also called a punch. So hit is a category. And then within that category, you have a slap, you have a punch and other forms as well. So we have, I'll just write the ones I shared. So we have slap. This is when your hand is open. I don't necessarily like teaching these violent words. Hopefully you don't use them, but I guess you'll see them on movies and stuff. Slap and then 
Punch is when your fist is closed. Punch. It was a mess. A mess. So to describe something as a mess, this is a negative. It's saying... Well, imagine your room. You might know this from a room in your house. Your kitchen is a mess. There's things everywhere. It's the opposite of clean. So we use this to describe a situation that is the opposite of an ideal situation. That's how I would describe it. (laughs) It being the situation... So the situation, in this case, the incident at the Oscars when he slapped someone, this situation was a mess. So it's the opposite of ideal, opposite of ideal, which is a good situation, right? So I might say the meeting was a mess. The meeting was a mess, which is... describes the meeting as negative. Many negative things happened, but you would have to ask me what happened because it's not clear. So it's just a general non-specific term to say that something negative happened, but you have to say why, what happened. And then, and then you could explain the client lost it when we told her, we're over budget. Remember? Remember we talked about to lose it. The client could not control her emotions or her actions. What do you mean you're over budget? This is unacceptable. And the client lost it. So the meeting was a mess. You can also use this for a room in your house, the kitchen. My kitchen is a mess. Now, in this case, it's saying it's dirty or not organized. That would be the definition of when you describe a room, a room as a mess, dirty or not organized. The interview on the late night U.S. TV talk show was the first time Smith had been publicly challenged about the attack. Smith told Noah he understood the often quoted theory that hurt people hurt people. Discussing the background to his Oscars assault, the actor said it was a lot of things. It was the little boy that watched his father beat up his mother, you know. All of that just bubbled up in the moment. That's not who I want to be. So to beat someone up, this means to violently attack someone. So it has a very negative meaning, especially when we're talking about a father violently attacking a mother, right? So to violently attack. And you can do that, obviously, by hitting someone, slapping someone, punching someone to violently attack. Now, notice it's a phrasal verb to beat up. So we have this preposition up is formed with the verb beat, which you conjugate and then you add the preposition up. Okay, to bubble up. Think back to our, when our emotions were bottled up, right? They're inside. You're not expressing them. Now imagine this is a fizzy drink like Coca-Cola or Sprite or something like that. If I shake it and that's Coke, when I open this, what's going to happen? If I shake a carbonated drink and I open it, it's going to explode. That is the meaning of bubble up. Because remember, your emotions are bottled up, but then they bubble up. They all come to the surface at once. So it's another way of saying explode. All of that just bubbled up. So you can say exploded. 
in that moment. And notice, bubble up, it's also a phrasal verb. We have our verb bubble and our preposition up. That's not who I want to be. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Will Smith. Smith has opened up before about growing up in an abusive home. So an abusive home, this is a home where you either witness violence, like he witnessed his father beat up his mother, or he also could have received violence himself. So it's possible that his father also beat him up. That is what we would describe an abusive home. Now, grow up. I find a lot of students notice or know how to use this, but often I see mistakes because they forget that it's a phrasal verb. You need the verb grow and the preposition up. So when you grow up in a home or you can grow up in a specific city, that means that is where you were raised. That's where you were a child and then you became older and older and older and became an adult. So you might say, I live in Florida now, but I grew up in Texas. So the, this means I spent most of my time when I was a child and when I was becoming an adult, that time when I grew up, I spent it in Texas. Now, remember, our verb is grow. So this is in the past simple. I grew up in Texas. Don't forget that preposition up. Now, the last thing I will share with you is our phrasal verb open up to open up. So to open up about something is when you share information about a, a negative or simply a personal event in your life. So Will Smith is saying he bottled up his emotions. He kept them inside, but then eventually he decided to open up. He decided to share that information. So he, maybe he told his close friends, maybe he told some, a therapist even, or he told some family members about the abuse that he experienced as a child. So he shared that personal information. So that is another great phrasal verb. So now you have a lot of new vocabulary from this article. I am going to read this article from start to finish so you can focus on the pronunciation uninterrupted. So I'll do that now. Will Smith says bottled rage led him to slap Chris Rock at the Oscars. Will Smith has said his bottled rage led him to slap comedian Chris Rock on stage at the Oscars in March. The actor has been interviewed for the first time since the incident, which he described as a horrific night. Appearing on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, he said, I was going through something that night, you know? Not that that justifies my behavior at all. Smith added that there were many nuances and complexities to it, but added, I just, I lost it. Smith stormed the stage at the Hollywood award ceremony after Rock made a joke about Smith's wife Jada's shaved head. She has the hair loss condition, alopecia. Hurt people hurt people. I understand how shocking that was for people, he told Noah. I was gone. That was a rage that had been bottled for a really long time. He said he also understood the pain he had caused and recalled the reaction of his nine-year-old nephew that night. He's the sweetest little boy, Smith said. We came home and he had stayed up late to see his uncle Will. And we're sitting in the kitchen and he's on my lap and he's holding the Oscar. And he's just like, why did you hit that man, Uncle Will? 
It was a mess. The interview on the late night U.S. TV talk show was the first time Smith had been publicly challenged about the attack. Smith told Noah he understood the often quoted theory that hurt people hurt people. Discussing the background to his Oscars assault, the actor said, It was a lot of things. It was the little boy that watched his father beat up his mother, you know? All of that just bubbled up in that moment. That's not who I want to be. Smith has opened up before about growing up in an abusive home. Amazing job with that article. Now, feel free to hit pause, take a break, go get a cup of coffee or tea, review the vocabulary you just learned, and when you're ready, hit play, and we'll continue on with the next article. Today, we're talking about U.S. President Joe Biden touching down in Ottawa. Ottawa is where I live, which is why I chose this article. And I'm sure you recognize this man. He's the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. So let me read this headline again. U.S. President Joe Biden touches down in Ottawa. First, let's talk about this phrasal verb, touch down down. And notice we have an S on it because it's conjugated with Joe Biden, which represents the subject he. U.S. President Joe Biden, he touches down in Ottawa. Now to touch down, this means to land and we use it specifically for a plane. As an example, I could say my plane just touched down, which means my plane just landed. To be honest, I would say that landed is more common than using the phrasal verb touch down. So if you're already comfortable with using what time does your plane land, my plane just landed, I say keep using it, but at least now you know what it means when you see it. Okay, let's continue on and talk about his trip in Canada. U.S. President Joe Biden arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa, for a whirlwind 27 hour visit. Now, first I want to point out that for everyone who doesn't know, the capital city of Canada is Ottawa. It is not Toronto. I think probably 90% of people think the capital city in Canada is Toronto. That's just not true. (laughs) Ottawa is the capital city which is where all the official government business takes place and which is why President Joe Biden is visiting Ottawa and not Toronto. Toronto is Canada's largest city. Okay, so make sure you know that the next time someone asks you about the capital of Canada. Arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa for a whirlwind 27 hour visit. Okay. What is a whirlwind? Whirlwind pronunciation. Whirlwind. A whirlwind. Now, this is being used as an adjective. And we often describe an event uh, like a visit, a meeting, a vacation, a conference as a whirlwind vacation, a whirlwind conference, a whirlwind meeting, a whirlwind visit is simply a visit where many, many things happen in a short period of time. So very active, many different activities. So he's going to go to a lot of different places, meet a lot of different people as well. And that's why you could describe your vacation or a meeting or a conference or even your summer. I had a whirlwind summer. It implies that you did many, many different things. You saw many, many different people. So I would say busy, eventful, see lots of people things. That's how I would describe it. And this is an adjective. So it's an adjective. So as an adjective, you would put it before what you're describing. Expected to focus on both the friendly and thorny aspects of the Canada-US relationship. Okay, so friendly, you know what that means. What about thorny? Well, thorn is 
something very sharp and a thorn hurts you. So that's kind of what you want to imagine. Those aspects of the relationship that are thorny, that can hurt you. So in this case, I would just say the positive aspects of the relationship, that's the friendly aspects. And then the thorny are the negative aspects of the relationship. Because obviously these two countries probably don't share the same opinion on every single topic. They probably have some debate that they're going to have as well. So that would be, I would just summarize it as negative, negative. So you could describe your relationship. I have a thorny relationship with my boss, with my coworker. So you're saying, you know, it's negative. There are things that hurt each other in that relationship. Okay. Thorny aspects of the Canada U S relationship. I don't know what those aspects are. <laughs> I guess right here, including protectionism and migration on both sides of the border. So I'm not sure if these are the friendly aspects or the thorny aspects. They don't really specify. Now, actually, before we move on, I want to talk about the pronunciation of Canada because I actually hear a lot of mispronunciation because of syllable stress. So a lot of students will put the stress on the wrong syllable or they won't put any stress on it. So it's Canada. It's not Canada. Canada. Sometimes I hear that where the da is really strong. Canada. No. Canada, Canada. Okay. That's how you say it. Like an American, like a Canadian. <laughs> Canada. So this duh is quite short. Canada, Canada. So now you know the capital of Canada, the largest city, and you know how to correctly pronounce it. All of these notes are available in a lesson PDF. So you can look in the description or the comment section to download the free lesson PDF. All right, let's continue on. It's quite a packed schedule. So a packed schedule, this is just another way of saying busy, busy. Now you could also think of it as crowded because you can say, the event, the event was packed. And in this case, packed means crowded. So there were many, many people in the event. So you couldn't really move around. It was crowded. But because we're talking about a schedule, it really more means busy. Now, honestly, you could use our same adjective as before and probably say it's quite a whirlwind schedule because what is a busy schedule? It's when you do lots of things, see lots of people, meet with lots of people. Well, that's also kind of the definition of busy, right? So you could use our other adjective whirlwind, or you can use packed as well. And then know that packed can mean crowded at the same time. So in terms of busy, you could say my weekend was packed. My weekend was packed, which means it was busy. Now, sometimes we actually add, which is kind of fun. I like saying this. We add the word action in front. Oh, my weekend was action packed. You don't have to say that. You can simply say packed, but that's just an option. Action packed or packed. All right. It was quite a packed schedule for a short trip, said White House National Security Council spokesman. Whew, that's a long title. John Kirby on Wednesday. This is a meaningful visit. Canada is one of the United States closest allies. Notice they have this apostrophe. This is to show possession. The United States closest allies and friends. So the allies belongs to the United States. The friends belong to the United States. So that's why now generally with possession, I would say that's my friend's shirt. So that is when I'm talking about my one friend, right? 
So my one friend, singular. Now this S is not plural, it's to show possession, it's to show the shirt belongs to my friend. Okay, now I could say, that's my friends, because I can say my friends and it could be plural. That's my friends. What could be a multiple item belonging to my friends? That's my friend's dog. <laughs> okay. Let's say I have two friends and they live in the same house and they share one dog. So the dog belongs to my friends, two friends, plural, but I just put the apostrophe here because there is already an S. So I don't need to put another S because that looks weird, right? So you don't need to put another S if it ends in an S. And this is to show possession. This is also to show possession. Okay. Canada is one of the United States closest friends and al allies and friends and has been now for more than 150 years. Why is it 150 years? Because that's how long Canada has been a country. It's been 152 or three years. <laughs> that's why they say more than. So since we became a country, this will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting. A bilateral meeting is a meeting between two people. So it's just another way of, of saying two people. I don't know why they really said it because it's already implied because it's Joe Biden and Trudeau and they're two people. Anyway, you could say I'm having a bilateral meeting with my boss. And this implies that the meeting is between you and your boss because bilateral is with two people. Now, let's say it's actually my boss's friend. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. So I'll say friend. But notice this is possessive because the friend belongs to my boss. Boss already ends in S. So I don't need to put another S there. If it were the other way around, my friend's boss. I put apostrophe S because it does not end in S. And this is also showing possession. I have a bilateral meeting with my friend's boss. Okay, let me highlight that for you. Between the two leaders in Canada since 2009. So it will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting. Now adding in person, because obviously in the last few years, a lot of meetings have taken place online. So it suggests that it's possible they had an online bilateral meeting. It's possible. Now notice we have since, since plus a specific time, since 2009, since last summer, since March 5th. And we use for with a time period for two weeks, two years. Now in this context, four doesn't work. You wouldn't replace. It will be the first in-person meeting for two weeks. It doesn't make any sense. So we can't replace it with four, but I'm just letting you know that there are specific times when you use sense or for in other cases, because I do see mistakes with those. In this case, we need to use sense and we're, we have to have a specific time because sense is only used with a specific time. Okay. The first year of Biden's term. So here's another possessive. The term belongs to Biden. The first year of Biden's term focused on rebuilding Canada U S relations following Trump's divisive term in, in office. All right, let's take a look at this focused on rebuilding, rebuilding. So notice a couple things. One, it's in the gerund form. My verb is in the ing gerund form. Why? 
because I have a preposition here. On is a preposition. And when we have a preposition, your following verb, in this case, rebuilding, needs to be in the ing, in the gerund form. So that's our gerund. So I'll just write that out for you. Preposition plus gerund. Now we have a re in front of building to say is happening again. So we're building it again. You might say, Jennifer, this lesson was awesome, but I need to re-watch it. I need to watch it again. Why? Well, because you need to practice everything I'm teaching you in this lesson, right? I need to re-watch this lesson at least <laughs> three times to really fully learn everything I'm teaching you in this lesson because I'm going quite fast, aren't I? So this means watch again. And notice for pronunciation, re, e. I'm not doing like a schwa sound, r, 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 watch. American pronunciation, we love our unstressed schwa sound in our throat here, but I'm not doing that. This is a full e, re, rewatch, rewatch. Watch it again. So hopefully you rewatch this lesson. Let me know if you're going to rewatch it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this divisive, 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 divisive. Trump's divisive term in office. Divisive comes from the word division, division, which also comes from the word divided. <laughs> when people are divided, when there's division between a group of people, it means some people think this and other people think that. And divisive is the adjective that's describing that. As an example, I could say his policy is very divisive. It causes some people to be here and other people to be here. It causes division. It divides people. So it's implying that Trump caused division between the United States and Canada, or at least their relationship. Let's continue on. The second focused on meeting obligations. The second, remember here, we are talking about the first year of Biden's term. Now we're talking about the second, the second year of Biden's term. The second focused on meeting obligations. So again, on is our preposition. So we have our gerund here, meeting obligations, including prioritizing orderly and safe migration, through regular pathways, Kirby said. Now heading into the third, the third year of his term, heading into, we use the word head as a replacement to the word go. So you could say going into the third term. Going, or I guess in this case, you might want to think of it as entering, but go, there's movement, right? And enter, there's movement as well. I'm going into the store. I'm entering the store. Now we do use head a lot. You could say I'm heading to the store. When do you head to the airport? And in this case, it means go. I'm going to the store. When do you go to the airport? It's extremely common. It sounds very natural. Americans, we love saying head as a replacement for go. So you can start with these two expressions and then add on some more to your vocabulary once you get comfortable with them. Now heading into the third, this visit is about taking stock of what we've done where we are, what we need to prioritize for the future. Okay, when you take stock of something, you basically assess the current situation. So you might say, we need to take stock of 
are finances. So you need to think about your current financial situation and then perhaps the recent past of it and then going into the near future as well. So the current situation, including the past and the present. So let me just write that out for you. Let's take stock or we need to, we need to take stock of our financial situation. As I said, I think the best replacement would be assess. When you assess something, you think about the current situation. So assess, think about the current situation. And in this case, it's the current situation of your financial situation. <laughs> A little bit confusing there using situation twice. So this visit is about taking stock of what we've done. So assessing what we've done, where we are and what we need to prioritize for the future. So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops during the trip. All right, let's take a look at neither nor. I did create a separate video on neither nor because I hear a lot of mistakes with it. So I'll put the link to that video in the comment, but just know that neither is used when it's negative. So it's saying not the White House and not the Prime Minister. So it's negative for the White House and it's also negative for the Prime Minister. That's what I'll say now, just because I do already have that full lesson on it. So I will just say <laughs> link to lesson in the video description on neither nor. It's a great video and I highly suggest you watch it. Okay. So you can watch that when you have time. It's a pretty short video as well. Just trying to get this. Let me just put this on a separate line for you. Neither, whoopsie. Neither nor. Oh, okay. Got it. Whew. So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops. Well, what's an impromptu stop? It's an unplanned stop. Unplanned. It seems like it would be obvious that there would be unplanned stops. For example, if you and I were going on a vacation, we wouldn't plan out every single place, including cafes, restaurants, stores in advance and have that on an itinerary, right? If we felt like going to a cafe, we would go to a cafe. Obviously, that's not how it works for the president for security reasons. Everything has to be very planned out so security can be present. So that's why an impromptu stop is unlikely. But it did happen when Barack Obama, former president Barack Obama, visited Ottawa many years ago. And that's what this picture represents. I'll continue reading this. So it hasn't been confirmed if there will be any impromptu, unplanned, impromptu stops during the trip, meaning we'll have to wait and see whether there will be another Obama cookie moment. If you come to Ottawa as a tourist, you will see this Obama cookie. It's very popular for tourists and it's because Obama visited Canada in Ottawa, where I live, the capital, remember, in 2009, and he had an impromptu stop, an unplanned stop. So he went to our tourist area, 
which is called the Byward Market. That's just an area of the city in our historic downtown where the tourists generally go. And he went to a bakery and he bought a cookie from that bakery. Remember, this happened in 2009. Today, if you go into that bakery, there are pictures of Obama everywhere. Like this picture is from the bakery. And this is a television. What I'm pointing at with my mouse is a television and it plays over and over again, Barack Obama's trip in Canada from 2009. It's pretty funny because even now it's a big tourist attraction in Ottawa to come see this Obama cookie. So if Biden makes an impromptu stop, maybe we'll have a Biden cookie in Ottawa as well or something like that. Okay, we'll have to wait and see if there'll be another Obama cookie moment when then U.S. President Barack Obama popped into a bakery in the Byward Market during his 2009 trip. I like this phrasal verb to pop into. When you pop into a store, a cafe, a bakery in Obama's case, it means you just enter quickly. So you just go in, you get your cookie and you leave. So most likely you're not going to stay for two hours and have lunch with a friend. You're just going to get something and leave. So if you're with your husband or wife or a friend, you might say, is it okay if we pop into this store? I need to buy. And then you can just tell whatever you want to buy. Okay. Now, when you say pop into your friend, your husband, your wife, they understand that is going to be quick. So even if you're on a schedule, they know, okay, it's not going to take a long time. So if someone asks you like, oh, did you visit the museum when you were in Ottawa? You might say, we popped in, we popped in, which means you didn't spend a very long time. So this is the same as saying visited quickly. We popped in. We just took a few pictures, looked around, but we had another appointment to get to. We just popped in. So we use this a lot when you're going to stores or you might go pop into a friend's house, which means you visit that friend for a brief period of time. So my friend popped in on over the weekend, just sometime over the weekend. Oh, my friend popped in over the weekend. So she visited me quickly. That's what it implies. And that's the end of the article. So now I'll read the article from start to finish so you can focus on my pronunciation. U.S. President Joe Biden touches down in Ottawa. U.S. President Joe Biden arrived Thursday evening in Ottawa for a whirlwind 27-hour visit expected to focus on both the friendly and thorny aspects of the Canada-U.S. relationship, including protectionism and migration on both sides of the border. It's quite a packed schedule for a short trip, said White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby on Wednesday. This is a meaningful visit. Canada is one of the United States' closest allies and friends, and has been now for more than 150 years. This will be the first true in-person bilateral meeting between the two leaders in Canada since 2009. The first year of Biden's term focused on rebuilding Canada-U.S. relations following Trump's divisive term in office. The second focused on meeting obligations, including prioritizing orderly and safe migration through regular pathways, Kirby said. Now heading into the third, this visit is about taking stock of what we've done, where we are, and what we need to prioritize for the future. 
So far, neither the White House nor the Prime Minister's office have confirmed if there will be any impromptu stops during the trip, meaning we'll have to wait and see whether there will be another Obama cookie moment when the U.S. President Barack Obama popped into a bakery in the Byron Market during his 2009 trip. Amazing job with this lesson now. What was your favorite new word from this lesson? Leave that in the comments below and leave an example sentence practicing your new vocabulary. And if you found this lesson helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head to my website and get your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.